designed this pumpkin, and with them we have in our enemies folder a bunch of pumpkin enemies. So we have a model for this pumpkin. Let's find, here we go. This is the model that Matt created for the pumpkin. And then separately are all these FBX files, um, all the animation data contained within them. Actually, in these cases, these are .ma. These are dropped in right from Maya, but they can also be FBX files. And in here, if I expand it, I can see I've got some sort of data in here, a bounce animation. It's going to be pretty tiny here. But you can tell something's bouncing up and down there. So the animation data is simply com combined in these separate files here. So what we're doing with that animation data at runtime is we have an animator component. Let me shift spacebar here to make this bigger. And what the animator component does here is this simply will take a animation state. And let me get out of this again to show you what an animation state is. These are simply, these little cubes here, these rectangles, do nothing more, absolutely nothing more than point to an animation file. These are the files that your animator creates, or you get from the Unity Asset Store. You can get literally tens of thousands. I think Mixamo in their catalog has over 10,000 animations available. Wow. So <laughs> these point simply to an animation file. If we click on one, we can see what it uh, points to here. Bounce one, bounce two. What's this system called, by the way? This is Mechanim. Mechanim, OK. In Unity, you had uh, several different animation systems. You had the legacy animation system and Mechanim, which introduced these ways of blending animations together and these state machines. Gives you a nice visual way to kind of see everything that's going on. So for example, let's take our zombie kid. Woo. So our zombie kid here, let's run this. And uh, let me actually make this not maximize. And we've heard the soundtrack many, many times. So let's mute that, oh, I'm sorry. There goes our- I know, uh... it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so zombie kid here, we get this auto live link. We can, say, we can see what's playing right now. Idle's playing. And in code, I can control it. I can say, as soon as I read input, transition to run. Well, how do I do that? I can set up little variables here. I can create a new variable, a Boolean variable called whatever I want. And I can control these in code through that animator component. So I could say, uh, I want you to transition to get hit when I set hit equals to true. How do I know when hit equals true to transition over? I click on the arrow. And I'm saying right now, the default is play animation, go right to this one. I don't want that. That's saying play the animation idle, and when you're done playing it, go to get hit. I want to actually trigger this only when hit is equal to true or false or whatever. As soon as that value becomes true, it switches. And you set those values in code. So if I go over to my project here, let's go back to our pumpkin controller. Right here. So let's say, for example, this was the git hit. If I wanted to call that animation right here, that was uh, the hit variable I added, the hit boolean value. If I wanted to trigger that animation, all I would say is animator dot set bool and give it the name of it, hit, comma true. And that would actually transition that animation state. And you can mix them a bunch together. You can do some really, really cool things. Uh, as I mentioned early on, I think in the first session that Mechanism allows you to have a character potentially shooting from the upper body and running with the lower body. And you can actually take multiple animation files and mix them all together. The sample assets have a great uh, example of that. They use a whole bunch of different animations for running and turning. Yes, to blend between where you kind states. of tilt over to the side a little bit That's while right. making a right turn. So we've got simply some code that's controlling the pumpkin state. And that code here, let's go back to this. Fixed update, the movement of the pumpkins, all we are doing. The pumpkin's entire existence says, as soon as we come to existence, whenever this fixed update, remember that runs with the physics step that happens uh, 50 times a second. Whenever we call fixed update, we're setting the velocity of our pumpkin in some vector. The forward vector, and since we're using this transform direction, is the forward vector for our pumpkin. Meaning, wherever our pumpkin is rotated, we're moving them that way. So how does that come into play in this scene? I have two spawn points. They're just random. A spawn point is nothing more than an empty game object. That's all. It's an empty game object. There's no properties to mm. it whatsoever. And I can simply, when I spawn something, 
just create it at that location. So I've got two spawn points here. Spawn left and spawn right, I, I guess. See, see them right across opposite sides of the, uh, the tombstone there. Spawn right, spawn left. So all they do, an object gets created right here and just starts moving in its forward direction. I create an object here and I rotate it towards the cross and it just starts moving in the direction. All that is accomplished simply by one line of code. Set its velocity to move forward, that's it. Now, the main character, so that's the pumpkin, a pretty dumb, I hate to even call it AI because it's really, 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 really basic. The main character, zombie kid here, notice when I highlight zombie kid, what do we see? On his little hammer there, I've got this big green box around it. That big green box just so happens to be... It's a collider, isn't it? Ooh, he's far down that chain, too. Yeah, and you'll see this a lot. When, you, when somebody gives you a 3D model, there are actually many levels nested deep of various bones, so to say, various aspects of this character. So if we look at Zombie Kid, you've got body, root, lower back, chest. You can work your way down. So right clavicle, right shoulder, right elbow, wrist. It comes like that. And typically when you get models and somebody gives it to you, uh, they're already auto-generated like that outside of like Maya or whatever the tool is. You can control that in that particular tool, but you'll see this quite often. And so what I did was I just found the club in here. And all I did was I added a box collider to it right here. So I could do the same thing and put one around his head for headshots. You could put one around his head. Now the reason I added the box collider here because I want to know when this hammer hits a pumpkin. So I added the box collider here. And my pumpkins, on the other hand, they have a sphere collider. Ah. So when this hits that, it triggers an event. Remember, we saw the events before. Well, it's kind of hard to read, too. Code here. Uh, Can we get it a little bigger? Crank this code up a bit. There we go. Now Remember, any time that we call collision events here, on collision enter. Now there's actually, what I did in this case was very slightly, slightly, slightly different. And you might notice here that this checkbox is checked off on our collider. So hmm. a collider can serve two purposes. A collider can be for physical interactions. We saw when we took our cubes and ran them into each other that they literally pushed one out of the way. It had a velocity, hit the other one and moved it. That's a collider uh, and a rigid body because we have mass. You can also have a collider, what's called a trigger. And what you are telling Unity is do not do any physical interaction but notify me. In other words, when one object comes within range of another's collider, don't push it out of the way, let it go through. But you notify me in code that something has happened. You can start whole event sequences using this. Exactly. Conversations or... Exactly. So in this case here, I'm simply, I don't want this pumpkin to get pushed out of the way. I want this really animation to go right through it but I want to be notified that that trigger happened and then I can decrement count and just destroy my pumpkin. Um, to your point, what you said, you can spawn off conversations, right? If I have, uh, let's say you could converse with a zombie sitting here, I could just take this guy and add on a, let's just do a sphere collider, just as an example here. Scale this out a ton and set it equal to a trigger. Unity will now notify my code event. I have to have I'll show you this here. On One important here. thing to talk about is uh, it's notifying the uh, code event for that particular object. For that particular object. And when you have a trigger, it's no longer on collision enter, it's on trigger enter. Mm -hmm. Very similar purpose. It's just one does, uh, one notifies you and there's a physical effect. One notifies you with no physical effect. So all I'm saying here, let's say your character comes in within this region bam, your zombie comes to life, or you start conversing with it. That's how regions are detected inside of Unity and many other systems as well. Now we can have them stop talking to me if I walk outside of that too. Yeah, so there's three with a trigger. You have three events uh, typically used in that case. You have what we're doing here, on trigger enter. You have on trigger stay, which fires near every frame uh, that you're within here. So this on trigger enter gets fired once when you move into this range. As long as you're in that range, on trigger stay keeps getting, and then you get on trigger exit when you get on out of there. So three events that you can use for that to detect exactly what the state of that character is in there. Uh, we added score, so let's do this. This is on our player, this is on our, our zombie kid. As soon as that hammer hits 
something called a pumpkin. We're checking to see if we are currently using our smash animations. Why would we do that? I'll tell you why. If we're standing there not doing anything and a pumpkin runs right into our hammer, do we want it to apply damage? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kill all the pumpkins. <laughs> we could, we could do it that way. Uh, I wanted somebody to run around this game and always have to hit them as opposed to stand there and let pumpkins run to them and die. So I wanted to make sure I was playing a smash animation before I would dole out any damage. That's all this code does right here. If I happen to be playing a smash animation, then I would give me a reference to that pumpkin's controller and I call a method on there called apply damage, which does nothing more than we basically had on our... So you could take these same concepts and apply them to other types of fighting games per se. Absolutely, this is exactly how Perfect. it's done. You call apply damage, it reduces the amount of your health. If your health gets less than or equal to zero, because maybe multiple things are hitting you at once, you always want to check if it's less than or equal to, then you start a coroutine. And this is kind of a weird looking thing. Die. Here. But So not only <laughs> die is a weird looking thing, <laughs> but uh, start coroutine. A lot of folks, if uh, you're joining us today, happen to be uh, a .NET developer or C or C++, whatever, and you're used to spawning off threads on a system, the question comes into play, how can I do threading inside of Unity? You don't spawn off threads in Unity. Uh, you start off coroutines. Unity works off a coroutine-based system. You can read about it on the net. It manages all that uh, for optimization's sake on the back end. So you basically tell Unity, I have the intent to start a routine. You give it the data, and it will schedule it in its uh, preemptive system on the back end. And so that's start coroutine. So I'm essentially saying, do the equivalent of starting off some other processing thread here, but in Unity, use coroutines. And I just call my die method. And I does... Exactly like it sounds. Exactly like, like it sounds here. I have some comments because we're going to build upon this more tomorrow. Die instantiates my particle system. And in this case, it actually deactivates the pumpkin. And we'll talk more on that tomorrow, why we would want to do that when we do our optimizations. And then we simply game controller increase score. And that's where we get our pumpkin hmm. count increasing on there. All the same concepts. So what we're doing here is we, we're using a rigid body to move our pumpkins. We are using a rigid body to move our player and our... I should have just overall bumped up the font size. Right here, we are doing the exact same thing on our player. We're reading the input from your keys and mapping that over to its vector. Same thing that we do with the cubes. And we have some other code in here. This guy right here. This looks a lot like 2D, just with an extra Z, doesn't it? All I'm doing right here, yes, exactly. So this is really a 2.5D game. It's a 3D world. Uh, but what I want to do here is I want that character to run back and forth. I don't want him to go anywhere else. So I'm really constraining him to some dimensions here. Uh, I also don't want him to run outside of the world. That's where you can use things like the math.clamp function. This, this code will all be available for download. I'll have some extra comments in here. The main thing is here, we are doing all the exact same stuff that we did with our cubes. We move an object, we detect a collision, we increment a score, and we destroy an object. And potentially, when we destroy an object, we spawn off a particle system. It's really a really easy process. Everything else just is, is on um, good graphics, <laughs> good gameplay, uh, tying that all together and making it something that kind of looks uh, very interesting. So uh, thankfully, the asset store, you can download a lot of cool stuff from there and use it or hook up with an artist, uh, really yeah. good ways to do that. I gotta find me a Matt Newman. Gotta find you Matt Newman. <laughs> <laughs> very, very talented fellow. So, that is it for the magic of a 3D game. That brings us to the end of our 3D session today, and we're gonna have about a 15 minute break this time before we continue on with the next session, and that's gonna be building your games for Windows, and we will see you then. Thank you very much. That's good, thank you everybody. Hi everyone, welcome back to developing 2D and 3D games with Unity for Windows. Uh, my name is Jason Fox. I'm David Voiles. Uh, I'm introduce myself, I'm new to the group here. Uh, my name, I am a technical evangelist for Microsoft as well. I focus on gaming, cloud, uh, client technologies like Windows Phone and uh, Windows Store. 
Uh, I've been doing development for about 13 years uh, after leaving the military. And uh, I've done a lot of stuff. I've done video games. I've done graphics programming. Um, 